Hello, everybody. It's me, Dr. Z. And I have with me, I gotta, I gotta switch cameras because we're live. David Fuller. All right. For people who don't know who David is, I'm gonna cut back to him so I can talk about him with my hand in the shot. David Fuller is a sexy British man with a beard. He is a former, uh, what is BBC Channel 4 journalist who hosts a podcast called Rebel Wisdom that really focuses on the heterodox space, sense making, and other things like that. We interview public intellectuals and Zubin Demania. That's racist. Uh, <laughs> public intellectuals and Dr. Z. And you and I actually connected um, during the pandemic. We had, I don't know how, who connected first, but we, we had a mutual sort mm. of uh, love affair with integral theory mm. and this kind of like all, what I call alt middle, which is really kind of integral. And uh, we started talking about making sense of the pandemic. How do we find, um, how do we find truth when everything seems so clouded? That's the simplest way I think about it. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, yeah, I was watching you. I think I was most struck by the piece that you recorded at the beginning of the pandemic where you were calling out people, basically calling out the medical system and saying, this pandemic is the thing that should burn this broken system to the ground. And it was like this call to arms. I was like, who is this guy? This guy is really channeling something really powerful. And then when we connected, I found not only did we have a lot of the the same kind of reference points, Jonathan Haidt's moral matrices and Ken Wilber and the integral framing. And then we kind of immediately, I think every time we've, basically spoken to each other or spent any time in each other's company. We've just been Dude, con bro, continually. Bro, like <laughs> bro. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's really true. There's an inexhaustible, um, yeah, there's inexhaustible kind of areas of alignment and conversation between us. I actually have a scientific algorithm for this. I've, call, I've had it for years. It's called the man spark. It's the mm. unit of energy that exists between two heterosexual men separated by one man length at mm -hmm. standard temperature and pressure. And I think our man sparks are off the chart. Do you have a way of measuring this? Uh, it's the man sparkometer, yeah. um, but it's still in development. I'm actually looking for funding. Guys, any <laughs> angel investors out there <laughs> looking to fund the, Let's look at some comments already. How's all the Democrat voters feeling? Well, did something happen with the, the I guess the, the, there's been some primaries and stuff and people are thinking it doesn't look good for the left in the US. In the US, yeah. I'm paying really close attention to this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, in San Francisco, they kicked out the district attorney who mm. uh, was brought in as the super progressive guy that was gonna like decriminalize crime, mm. basically. I'm, I'm overstating this, but uh, they booted him out because guess what? Petty crime and all that stuff went through the roof. And, and people don't like the idea of decriminalizing crime? You know what it is? It's not that they don't like, in San Francisco, sure, you can decriminalize crime, mm. but if it, it results in your car window being broken and your shit taken, that's when you gotta draw a line, like not in my back car. To be honest, that's political correctness gone mad, isn't it? It uh, sort of is. Yeah. If we're being completely honest. open about this, it's like, it's one thing to really believe that our criminal justice system is fundamentally flawed and that it's punitive rather than uh, rehabilitative and that many of the things, uh, many of the functions of criminality mm. are beyond the control actually of, criminal, but are all the aspects that go into that. If you were molecule for molecule, that person, mm. you might've behaved the same way that you can believe, know all that and still demand that you need a deterrent against crime because otherwise yeah. it's heart of darkness, you know? Yeah. And not wanting to get too political, but it was very interesting at the time where there was the whole kind of defund the police energy. There wasn't really much focus play, paid to, well, is that what the poorest people in these communities actually want. And people who were pointing out that maybe it isn't, maybe this is a kind of elite discourse that is detached from reality. I don't know if you remember David Shaw. I don't. Who was a, he was a Democrat pollster who basically at the height of the kind of defund the police madness, I would say, posted that the riots, or it was also during the, 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 the Black Lives Matter protests and where some of them have gone really violent he said that he posted some some data on how the the riots in the 70s had actually worked in favor of nixon and had, uh. had led to more kind of uh right-wing governments being elected and people didn't want to hear it i think he was sacked for that at the time mm. um, yeah, I, interesting it's it's a it's a very interesting dynamic like where the elite kind of discourse gets dis gets kind of detached from the very people that they're supposedly supposed to be kind of representing or 
looking after the interests of. That's exactly right. And I think um, in San Francisco, it's interesting because there was recently an article, by the way, I just fixed the audio. Some my assistant was yelling at me that people were realizing, I remember I had it panned left and right from our previous interview. Yo. They're like, why is David in one ear, the right ear? Are you making a political statement about David? No, but, but so you. back so back to the um, the San Francisco thing. There was a good article in the Atlantic called "Why Atlanta, Why San Francisco Is a Failed City," and I think did, did you have a chance to peep at it? I've only read the first couple of paragraphs. Right, right, and basically there were these three. I failed. You are a failed journalist. That's really what I think. Mm. So. <laughs> what it basically said was these three kind of elements, and they're all very practical. Housing costs, which were uh, uh, elevated by the nimbyism, the not in my backyard, uh, yeah. where you just can't build in San Francisco because there'll be so much local opposition to development. The uh, homelessness and drug uh, addiction problems where people are shooting up on the street because of the mm. permissive attitudes toward that and the decriminalization and the lack of actual um, real support so that you have this just, just what used to be public spaces are now just people are shooting up. Mm. And, um, and there's mental health component of that too. And the third thing was schools closing during COVID. Now this, this mm. is interesting. Did they close schools in the UK during COVID? Not for any length of time. They were, they were closed for a little bit, mm. um, but not for long is my understanding. I don't have children, so I wasn't completely dialed into that yeah, yeah. narrative. But I think there was some home homeschooling, but but not for a long period of time. Yeah, and in San Francisco, which again is it is the bastion of kind of progressive ideology in in the U.S. Really, yeah. you could look at New York, you could look at the big cities, but really San Francisco is where they push it as yeah. far as it can go to kind of see okay what's happening. And the schools were closed for a year plus, and the school board was talking about, the perception was that they were busy talking about, should we rename Lincoln Elementary because he was a white oppressor? Yeah. Should we rename it, you know, Cesar Chavez University or whatever, whatever it was? They were talking about that, but they weren't talking about actually the real equity issue, which mm -hmm. was poor kids aren't in school. Yeah. And they don't, you know, the zoomocracy can survive that, but these kids cannot. So the yeah. deep equity issue. So like you said, the distinction between the elites Mm -hmm. understanding of what, you know, the utopia they wanna build and the on the ground experience of the citizenry mm -hmm. results in a recall that's now kind of shaking San Francisco's political base. They're like, mm -hmm. well, no, we actually want livable, affordable place that's not got all this crime and that um, has schools, for yeah. public schools for our kids that we're paying for with our taxes. Mm. And this is one of the topics that we connected over was responsible heterodoxy. Yeah. Like what are the, this sort of sense of the fragmentation of the landscape into what our mutual friend Peter Limburg called thesis and antithesis, kind of pro and anti COVID measures, and what are the things that should be questioned? And one of the things that should be questioned clearly is school closures because of the effect that it's had and the long term effect that it's had on achievement and options and prospects for, for people. So, yeah, may, maybe we can dive into that. Yeah, I was going like to say the, the landscape because that's where we really connected last year yeah. about that big question of like, where does the mainstream narrative need to be questioned? Because there was a lot of defensiveness on the mainstream side. And where does the heterodox narrative that should be there to question the mainstream, where does that go off the road and start getting into um, kind of anti-vaccine activism or kind of crazy ivermectin uh, evangelism as this sort of like crazy, this sacrament that will kind of cure COVID and prevent anyone getting it. Like th these, this is sort of our, the history of our, connection in a way is kind of looking into these questions and finding that there's no real easy answers and there's also nowhere where these conversations are being had. There's nowhere where these echo chambers and these filter bubbles are coming together. But that's kind of one of our main. That That's right. I, as Because you kind of started Rebel Wisdom as a way to go, hey, you know what? There's this community of alternative media that's coming up mm. that is looking at the mainstream and going, why are these guys not telling these stories in an actual truth-seeking nuanced way and all the mm. conflicts that happen in mainstream and all the capture to advertising revenue and whatever it is that are, that's capturing mainstream mm. and the CNNs and the Foxes. And you have the rise of the intellectual dark web, which is the true, you know, the early heterodox, the, the Sam Harris's and the Joe Rogan's and, mm. and others. And you started Rebel Wisdom, it sounds like as a way to kind of go, hey, where is the wisdom in these mm. rebels? Am I understanding that right? Yeah, I kind of consider it the sort of hero's journey of leaving the legacy media and going out into the kind of badlands of the alternative and finding the ideas that I think are existentially important 
aligned to some degree with some of the topics that people talk about on platforms like Sam Harris, Joe Rogan, the kind of intellectual dark web. There's some overlap with that as a Venn diagram. Mm. But actually, I think the, the center of gravity of rebel wisdom, as hinted at in the name, is the wisdom traditions, is mm. what can we integrate from? How, have, how has the Western way of conceptualizing what human beings are and this kind of very narrow focus on things like GDP or um, quality of life metrics that make no real impact on like what is a human being what are our, what are what are we really what are we trying to achieve what is the and also the kind of integration of the sacred a mm. sort of sense of a of a culture that's really lost touch with the sacred which is again i think where we overlap and many of our interests in things like integral theory which is was an attempt in the sort of 90s and early 2000s to create a kind of integrated field of of human knowledge that incorporated the spiritual, incorporated meditation, incorporated kind of experiences of the transcendent. And my sense is that those experiences of the transcendent, as we see in small areas like, for example, the rise in psychedelic medicine, like that for me is a really interesting area because it challenges our whole medical paradigm about what is the psyche, what is a human being, how on earth can this kind of transcendental experience of oneness that you get from psychedelics challenge so many addictive patterns, so many health patterns? So th these are the areas I've always been interested in. Not so much, it overlaps on the Venn diagram with the kind of intellectual dark web space, but it's much more my kind of more, the most interesting place for me is like, how do we challenge the sort of dominant materialist reductive paradigm that we're operating in, which I know is is overlapping with a lot of your interests in the medical space as well. That's 100% our, our main overlap. And, and it's funny because when we connected, I remember going, oh, Rebel Wisdom, man, they did an incredible interview with, um, with Ken Wilber. And I watched all three or four hours of it and I was just riveted the entire time. Mm. And f the synergies where people of like interest kind of they gravitate to each other. What we're shocking, like how did we end up connecting? And it happened at exactly the right time during pandemic when we could talk about how do those things relate to our situation now where we're trying to make sense of a world that is so fractured by the meaning crisis, Peter Lindbergh's uh, framework, who you introduced me to. Mm -hmm. um, you've been a huge influence on me actually, and which, which can't be overstated. Peter Lindbergh's idea that there's all these crises that have arisen in modernity now mm -hmm. that have sh have driven us to a situation where we're fractured and we're having trouble making sense of the world. We can't mm. even agree on what's true anymore. And it didn't used to be that way. So mm. we used to have a common sense of meaning. So the meaning crisis. Yeah. And, and I think rebel wisdom actually points a little bit at that. Like what are the wisdom traditions? What were they telling us? Mm. You, you pointed at the hero's journey, right? Like mm. the hero's journey is that archetypal mm. uh, myth of the, 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 the person on Tatooine who's living what they think is their life and realizing something's not right. The mentor comes, they go on this journey, they fight or redeem the father mm. and they return yeah. with this new wisdom to help integrate into the world and for fellow people. And uh, if pandemic feels like that kind of aborted hero's journey for many. It's mm. like they went on this journey and, and got lost somewhere. <laughs> well, it's sort of the, yeah, the dislocation of the, of the home life, the dislocation of the real. Like the call to the adventure is where you sort of you're, you're pulled out of your normal daily experience. So I guess you're right. I've not really thought about that. That there is an overlap with the pandemic of everything familiar being uprooted, mm. and then the journey that you go on through that, where you're faced with yourself, your own resources, the quality of your relationships. Um, there's a wonderful. I think Jamie Wheel we interviewed early in the pandemic, and he said the it it was an apocalyptic moment in the Greek sense of the word apocalypse means unveiling. Mm. So that's the literal origin of the word apocalypse. And in a way, the pandemic was a kind of unveiling of, because it threw you back on like, how how good are your relationships? Mm. Like you're, you're stuck in your house with the relationships that you've maybe neglected for, for an awfully long time. That fucking cat, yeah. hate it. <laughs> how good is your relationship with yourself? How good are you at spending time with yourself? All of the, and it was a kind of real unveiling of, yeah, like, the, the the reality that maybe you've been trying to avoid and it are and it made people ask a lot of really deep questions about purpose about kind of is this really what i want to be spending the rest of my life doing which i think is the opportunity like there's 
there's a lot of negatives, I think, that have come out of the pandemic. But one of the unexpected positives, I think, is a lot of people asking these questions now about purpose, mm. about meaning, and a realization. I, I hope a new openness to some of the questions that we've been talking about on Rebel Wisdom, some of the questions we've been answering, some of the sorry, asking some of the some of the people we've been interviewing, now starting to find more of a place for that. And that's my real hope now, I think, is that there is a new openness to to those questions. And the questions of sort of personal growth and um development that we are all going through as a as a culture and and, and individually as well. I mean they're talking about the great resignation. Like mm. what a perfect yeah. opportunity to look back inwards and go, what is it that I am trying to do in the world? What's my position? It is a hero's mm. journey, an internal hero's journey. The the other interesting thing correlating to what you're saying, this kind of pandemic as an apocalyptic unveiling. Mm. The piece that you referred to that I did early in the pandemic mm. was <clears throat> I've been talking about healthcare transformation for 10 years mm. and have been pounding the drum of Health 3.0, this Wilberian integral medicine where mm. it's a new emergent that says yes and to the previous, incorporates the beauty from the previous stages and, and integrates the shadow side. Like, mm. you know, in the early days, it was fee-for-service medicine. You get paid to do things to people. That has a shadow side. There's fraud, there's overtreatment, et cetera. Okay, well, take the deep personal relationship from that keep that between mm. doctor and patient and you know nurse and patient and so on and but but reject that shadow payment model cuz it doesn't work then second mm. phase is this mechanized world of medicine where it's all commodities and assembly lines and toyota lean processes and mm. so on electronic health records and mechanization and that that well that works for process management but the humanity has been mm. lost the sacred connection is gone the spirituality the the component of the internal connection to being is stripped away. In mm. fact, consciousness itself is stripped away. So internal states are gone. Everything's reduced to an it. Yeah. Okay. There's beauty there in the systems improvement, but how much shadow, right? So yeah. 3.0 is this new emergent. Now the pandemic hits and I see our system falling apart. I see nurses wearing trash bags on themselves. I see administrators who had been planning, had never planned for this, not having enough N95 masks and people losing their lives because they're exposed because they're heroic. They actually are idealistic. It's a calling for them. You know, they're helper types. Mm. And I went on a rant where I was like, we will never fucking forget what this system did to us in the moment when we needed this system to work. Mm. It means our system is broken, it's fragile. We won't forgive the leaders who didn't lead, who managed instead of led, and we and we won't. And you know what happened? I thought this was gonna be a turning point. Mm. Instead, we accommodated to it, we adjusted, the profits came back as the government poured money in, and a, an opportunity for real transformation, I think, is gonna be delayed even further. But mm. at least there's an opening now, right? Yeah. 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 There's, what do they say? A crisis is a terrible thing to, to waste. Yeah. Yep. There's some truth in that. There is definitely truth in that. And now on 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 our sort of collaboration, let's see if there's some um, comments here. It's the middle of the day. Risa wants us to do an alt middle Indian accent bad karaoke. Well, you know, that's quite a high uh, high bar. Chris says, COVID was a problem that diagnosed the system, all systems, societal, interpersonal, and intrapersonal. Mm. What do you think about that? Intra. Personal. But interpersonal and intrapersonal. What's the difference? I think what he's pointing internal. at internal is, or, or she's pointing, or they're pointing at, is internal, um, inside the person. Which, by the yeah. way, is not a is not a person. Mm. It's a mind system. It's like yeah. almost a committee. Yeah. The one of the most influential new therapeutic models is what's called internal family systems. Yeah. Which is about working with all of these different parts. And and recognizing that we are yeah we're a multiplicity rather than an individual. I contain multitudes, right? Yeah. But this is really you can experience this in an internal dialogue you have when you're trying to order at dinner. Mm. If there's almost a committee that's making decisions. There was a book uh, called The Mind Illuminated. Mm -hmm. uh, Chula Dasa is a teacher. He's a neuroscientist and Buddhist teacher, and it's all about the the details of med meditation, vipassana type insight meditation and. The model they propose is based on the old sort of, uh, I think it's Theravadan Buddhism ideas of the mind system, yeah. that it's really, there's no mind. Mm. It's a collusion of different um, sub-minds yeah. that project contents into a space of awareness. That's like mm. almost like the whiteboard or the PowerPoint at a meeting. Mm. So you have this board and they're all, they all get a chance to put a mind moment out there onto mm. the board and it's like, 
pearls on a string, not like film where it's like, brrr, it's like different beads on a string. Like here's an auditory mind moment from your, mm. your hearing sub mind. Here's a visual mind moment. And each of those sub minds is made up of more mm. sub minds like color, shape, form. And so experience is this sort of constant dynamic give and take of all these uh, sub minds trying to get the attention space on that mm. board. So Are you familiar with voice dialogue? No. Process of voice dialogue. No. So that came out of a Buddhist tradition where you you try and effectively inhabit those different minds and then you call them out. And one of the ways in, in Buddhist, I've, I've seen people do this before, where they can actually speak from big mind. Ah, yeah. So you can actually access that that sort of part of you that is your higher self or your that, that there's a there's a real sense of presence and knowingness. And I think advanced meditators have worked with this quite a lot. Will will work with all these different parts of themselves in voice dialogue. The the idea oh, that's fascinating because the idea of big mind I always associate it with dropping into presence mm. and having a. It's almost like the sub minds are quieted, and you are speaking from a state of presence in a way that you don't even know what you're saying. You're not thinking mm. about it. It's it's channeling a deeper, more present awareness. And yeah. that means it's not hampered by discursive thinking. You, you don't have this feeling of I'm a self projecting words out in the world, it's just words. Mm. Uh, and what comes out is often you can feel when you're in it, it's a kind of a pocket or a flow state. And uh, that that can be practiced. That's not, mm. it's not something you have to be born with or gifted or some guru. It, it's available for every human, it's like our birthright. Mm. And so that's interesting, it's called voice dialogue. Voice dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. Check it out. Really interesting. What do we have for comments here? <clears throat> Lisa Goodman, good stuff, guys. Enjoy listening to y'all. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lynn says, R.I.P. Chuladasa John Yates. Did he die? Oh my gosh. Who? The guy who wrote the book, uh, uh, um, mm. The Mind Illuminated, which by the way was, it's really interesting when you look at like personal growth paths and thing like that. Mm. As a science-minded, diligent overworker, yeah, that book really resonated as a f intro to hardcore meditation for me mm. because it's stages that you can accomplish. Like you start focusing on the breath, then you focus on, then you're doing body scan. It's it's like one of the vipassana retreats, but mm -hmm. very systemic with theoretical explanations in between. So it really feeds the intellectual mind, which can be a hindrance. Mm. But for me, it was a great way to develop the discipline of it and a structure. And then I, dro I dropped it all. I'm like, I, I can't mm. use this book anymore. I have mm. to just drop into presence and be from there. Mm. And that's the meditation is more open monitoring type meditation. Mm. Um, and we can talk about psychedelics and things like that if you're interested, but um, let's see, where are we at? Uh, Dodgins says, don't forget talking about awakening and ego later on, this might be an interesting clash of perspectives. I don't know mm. that we clash so much, do we? I doubt it. Yeah. Um, we've we've found a really real interest in the Enneagram recently. Yeah. Which is sort of a path of awakening. And I, the interesting clash that I find often with meditators is, and we've talked about this a little bit, of there's a worldview of meditation that I find quite I'm, I'm probably coming more from a therapeutic sort of background. Yeah, I, I'm sort of firmly of the belief that we need to do the therapeutic work, the relational work. Meditation has its place, and that play, that kind of space of really connecting to the the vertical and the horizontal is a really good way of looking at it. The vertical is a connection that you can get through psychedelics or through meditation or through deep um, breath work, for example, of really tapping into that sort of big mind space and. Then there's the horizontal of the relational work, which you can't neglect. And often what I find with meditators is they they can often be very good at the direct kind of vertical connection, but they sometimes neglect the, the horizontal. And there's a kind of worldview hidden within meditation that says, you don't need to worry about that. You just sort of sit with whatever's coming up and allow it to dissolve, which has its place. But if that's your only tool, then effectively any interpersonal stuff you can have, you can then come back to, well, I just need to let go of my attachment to, to this relationship or let go of my attachment to this behavior pattern. And it doesn't work, but you've actually got to do the relational work and the intersubjective work of something like um, internal family systems or other kind of more relational therapeutic work. And so I'm, a, I'm very much holding the, the, the candle for that as against a purely 
meditative or purely um, vertical space. Even though that has its place, I think it can be overvalued. And in the same way in the psychedelic community, I find that people within the psychedelic community can fetishize that state and not do the work. My experience is that the more that I've done the relational work, the more I feel able to hold on to the insights that I've achieved in some of these transformative experiences. And it's only through changing some of my relationships, building in some of that presence into the into those relationships, more of that truth, um, certainly orienting my relationships more towards truth, that I felt more able to live from the places that I've maybe only glimpsed in those kind of elevated states. I, I think what you're pointing at is well, actually- I don't think we disagree, but let's find out. Yeah, but you know, you know what, it's, this is interesting. When I talk about meditation, <clears throat> I can sometimes give off the vibe that this is the answer, mm. right? But but everything you said is absolutely correct. It is about waking up in that spiritual line of development. It's also about growing up from a standpoint of personal development because you have to come back. It's a hero's journey. Mm. You start thinking you're a body and a mind and you're separate and you're suffering. You Something shakes you up whether it's a mentor or a peak experience or a psychedelic experience in college or whatever it is, or you go out in nature and you have this thing and you can't explain it and you know that something's there, but you don't know what it is. You then embark on the hero's journey through trials and tribulations. And some of that hero's journey is meditation so that you can more easily disidentify from thoughts, body, sensation, a transcend, mm. or as Andrew Holacek says, subsend, because mm. it's actually below the level of, um, there's that kind of this more- I'm very skeptical of transcendence as a as a path. It's generally spiritually bypassing, I think. So, and that's what I wanna talk about. So mm. that's a piece of it, right? So you can tra transcend the body, but then what does that mean? The hero's journey means always you have to be able to come back and embody it mm. in the world. And you cannot, if you're living in unbound consciousness, just going everything is empty awareness, mm. this is all an illusion, and I'm not my thoughts in my body and they don't matter. Mm. That's spiritual bypass. Yeah. yeah. It's an unlivable, as uh, well, Jordan Peterson would call it an un unplayable game. Mm. And there's also the paradox of it takes a strong ego to be able to go beyond it as well. Mm. Mm. Like mm. you can't really, if you've got a fragile sense of self, then some of these spiritual practices can be quite destabilizing. And that experience of, as Jung, Jung had a, Jung's framework was about the self with a capital S mm. and that the, and that's kind of the, the divine part of us that is kind of identified in some ways with all that is, and mm. that we, we can theoretically access through meditation or psychedelics or any of these spiritual practices. Jung advised very strongly never to confuse yourself with the self. Mm. And that the ego, there's this constant dynamic of the ego trying to make that personal. Mm. And that's a huge mistake and leads to all sorts of things like psychedelic narcissism is mm. one of the, the real examples of that. And anyone who spent any time around the psychedelic community and seen how many huge egos there are, how Which many you, toxic, you have done. Di yeah. toxic dynamics there are, psychedelic narcissism is a huge thing because it's almost part of the journey that we identify with those. We can have those sort of transcendent experiences of of connection, of inspiration, and then the ego grabs hold of it and goes, yes, yeah. I am that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, no, you're not. Like, you, you are not that. But that becomes, it's so tempting to identify with them and then make it personal, whereas it should be a sort of experience of going beyond the, the individual consciousness. The individual consciousness just latches onto it and then starts... That's a very dangerous thing to do, I think. It's it's in uh, meditative circles. That's the spiritual ego. So it's the yeah. it what the it's, and and my friend Angelo says says this. Angelo Dulu says it this way. He goes, the ego doesn't take waking up lying down. Hmm. It's an existential threat to its sense hmm. of having to reify, make real itself and other. Yeah. And so what it does, is it says, oh yeah, I'm the one that awakened here's my story, mm. or I'm the one that had this experience. I, I have these experiences on psychedelics and, and, I, I'm, the, and I'm more awake than you. So there's mm. also the comparing mind and all of that. Yeah, it's sort of Chogyam Trungpa's cutting through spiritual materialism. Ah, he named it ah. in the 1970s. Yeah, I mean, and it was common back then too, because everyone thought, oh, this is the answer, bro. Like in the West, mm. they were starting to discover this and they're like, we just transcend everything, man. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't and, work like that. And that relates to the idea of enlightenment as a final state, which I think has been one mm. of the key problems. Mm -hmm. If you look at something like someone like Andrew Cohen, 
right. who had the famous um, collapse of his meditation community. He was created. He created something called Enlightened Next back in, I'm guessing the 80s, no, not maybe 90s. It, it was certainly big in in the 2000s. It was validated by Ken Wilber and was they had quite flashy headquarters. There was one in London and. Andrew Cohen kind of identified himself as a kind of guru figure, and then it all came out that there was there was nothing sexual. I think he it was mainly control, power trips, dynamics, and he's now come out as he kind of tries to kind of rehabilitate rehabilitate himself, and is saying that this idea of enlightenment as a final state that came over with kind of the Eastern tradition, he thinks is a is a catastrophe mm. because it basically says there is no more work here yeah. to be done. Therefore, anything that is present in our interpersonal relating that is a problem is on you. It can't be me because I am realized. Ah. And that is the incredibly dangerous and why so many kind of of these spiritual communities, why this is such a dangerous dynamic because you're you're dealing with people's souls in some way at that at that stage. And mm. you You've got the tools to make the other person wrong. You're like, yeah. well, that judgment you've got of me is just your ego speaking. Yeah. And as soon as you accept that kind of worldview, the the ground starts to shift underneath you and there's no there's no kind of reference points. Mm. And then the power dynamics start coming in, you you open the, the door for people to kind of start manipulating it. And it's I think the the root of it is this idea which I think is a mistake. I don't think there is a such a thing as a final state of enlightenment. I right. think, no, I think the idea that there is, is kind of anti, it's it's a bit weird that we think that because we know that the universe is continually unfolding. And yeah, continually it's, it's, kind of, it's fractal in its yeah. uh, emergence. And, and the idea that, I almost think this idea that enlightenment is a goal is a Western idea. Even enlightenment mm. is kind of a Western word. You know, they talk about realization, they speak of liberation, but enlightenment is kind of like, oh, I've attained, mm. you know, video game status, enlightenment attained, you know, high score. And that who who is attaining that enlightenment? It's it's egoic yes. kind of construction. There's a reference. Re read out the the Dajian's comment there, because that's I was yeah, thinking I'm, of that before. Uh, so watch the interview between Cohen and Jamie Wheel, which came out last month. It's really, really interesting. You sent me that, David. And yeah, I sent the the I, the transcript. The transcript. And it was so that. long I didn't read it. And I need to read it. So basically this was um so Jamie Wheel, who I've interviewed many times on Rebel Wisdom, and he wrote a book called Stealing Fire and recently Recapture the Rapture, did an incredible interview with Andrew Cohen. Really, really amazing. Um, one of the few people I think who's equipped psychologically and spiritually equipped to challenge Andrew Cohen really deeply, and it was a fascinating, fascinating interview. I haven't listened to it, but mm. I've read the the transcript. And my favourite bit of it, which I actually sent to Jamie and said I thought it was the best bit, um, which I'll re I'll read out yes. a bit from it. So Andrew Cohen basically said that he he realized that he was playing out unconsciously the archetype of the of the bad boy who needs to be punished. Um, so this is this is him speaking. So I kind of realized in that moment what I was going through and what I've been going through was that if I couldn't be the perfect guru, I was going to be the bad boy who deserves to be punished. And then I remembered it and thought, oh my God, is that what this is about? Because my shadow pulled it off because I was now internationally famous for being the bad boy who deserves to be punished. And I realized that my shadow won in that moment. And Jamie interrupts him to say, yeah, I mean, and to think you could have just sorted that out with some latex and a ball gag. I mean, son of a bitch. <laughs> and it's clear that Andrew just didn't, it went completely it went right over, over Andrew's his head. head. He didn't yeah. get it at all. Um, <laughs> but that was, and I sent that to Jamie and I was like, Jamie, that was that was brilliant. And I can tell that Andrew didn't get it. And Jamie's like, I feel fully seen. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. you know, again, it's that kind of, level of self insight mm. that I think you can become blind to when you, when the spiritual ego gets that strong. Yeah. In, in Zen, they call it Zen stink. Mm. Like this idea that, oh, you know, I'm awakened-ish or more awake than X mm. or so on. And you act from that. And that that's not an embodied, that's not an embodied way of being in the world from mm. the experience of awakening, right? Yeah. It, it, it's, in fact, it's antithetical because you 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 know that there that everything is unconditional connection, love, and presence, and yet, but mine's more unconditional and more loving and more present than X. And also, by you criticizing me, it's your ego speaking. So mm. you need to introspect, you know, yeah. this kind of thing. Um, Chris mentions here. I, I like Andrew Holacek's idea 
of developmental maturity spectrum. So Andrew Halachuk was on my show. He's mm. friends with Ken Wilber and it's Ken's uh, spiral dynamics based model where you have lines and levels of development across the spectrum in, in humans. There's spiritual mm. lines like awakening. And if you just have a spiritual line, that's spiritual bypass. If mm. you, then you have the psycho, psycho, um, uh, psycho what am I trying to say? Psychological mm. <laughs> lines of development. You have the intellectual lines of development like math and conceptual stuff. And you have physical lines of development, sports mm. and, and balance and things like that. And they all have a, have a piece of this. They don't all unfold equivalently. But mm. if you are focusing on only one line of growth, you're gonna miss other things, which is where we started talking about the Enneagram. Mm. So one thing you said, where might we disagree? And when we were talking about meditation, mm. I talk about meditation so much. Now I started to feel into why is meditation so important to me as opposed to say going to therapy mm. or circling and doing emotion work and that kind of thing. And then I got back into the Enneagram after you reminded me and I mm. realized, well, you know what? I'm largely a six based mm. and reading more about the six. Every, every line I read, I'm like, that's so me, it's scary. Mm. Um, but the, it's, that's my personality. When you say me, that's the personality that I have, the mm. operating system that I'm running. They say that the way that the six tries to actualize is to get out of the head and into the body and into presence. Mm. And they say, you know, meditation is a good way to do this for the six. Mm. The six actually tries to escape the flurry of anxiety and thought-based identification by going into meditation. Now, if you mm. only do that, then all your baggage is not all your personality baggage isn't gonna wake up. But that's why I think I, I'm so gravitated towards meditation. Mm. Yeah, let's see here. Uh, infrared maturity level up against Jamie's ultraviolet. So Chris says that, Expl mm. explain what she's talking about or he's talking about. Let's see. Cause it's K-R-I-S, so you never know. Infrared maturity level up against you. I so so that's I, that's I guess it's a is that a spoof of Ken Wilber's it, model? It's or? it's yeah. I think I think they're being serious but making fun of the kind of interaction that they were talking about. So infrared is kind of a low level of development in whatever line you're talking about. Mm. So it might be that Andrew Cohen is infrared in self insight around personality disorder mm. or whatever it is. Yeah. And Jamie is ultraviolet. So mm. really kind of sees that clearly, right? Yeah. And when they when they meet, and this is actually an important teaching thing of Wilbur's, when a when a when a level of development that's quite that's nested in a in a growth hierarchy here mm. meets something here. A couple things can happen. The lower level can see the higher level as completely foreign and alien and just in, unintelligible. Mm. When the higher level is speaking only at that high level, and the higher level can see this person as as idiotic, or the high level can recognize that all levels are necessary and appropriate and beautiful, and you speak to that level and try to uh, maximize it. And so, so Jamie would speak at a level that 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 level would actually understand instead mm. of, uh, and so try to nudge it up. But it is interesting because that's why I think people in alt, middle or integral mm. sometimes sound a little alien to someone in like, you know, blue conservative or orange or green liberal or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And sort of second tier can look from, from relativistic postmodern to be, it looks like orange, we're going to get into the into the language here. Into yeah, the you got to do it. But yeah. from but from an orange perspective, which is sort of modernist perspective, second tier can look like postmodern. Yeah, and they can. So yeah, it's it it's interesting because it it integrates complexity. It can look kind of postmodern from a kind of sort of unipolar modern lens. Yeah. So another way to say that is, you and I try to fancy ourselves that we're striving in this integral level, mm. which is the first tier two level, meaning all the other previous levels of development all excluded the others. Yeah. They did not find validity in the others. And this is the first level that says, no, actually all those levels are necessary components of growth and they're all within us yeah. and they're all to be honored and they're all to be to be optimized. Mm. And the integral level says yes, and then emerges something even bigger, mm. but, but, when you're in a level like say green pluralism, which is what we consider now maybe liberal or progressive, mm. um, looking at what an integral person is saying may actually sound to them like mm. a conservative viewpoint, yeah. like a regressed viewpoint. Yeah, particularly because our culture right now re rejected traditionalism. Yes. Sort of 
had lost touch with traditionalism, which was part of the journey of rebel wisdom, was recognizing the validity of that, where it was coming back into the culture, largely through someone like Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson. and the Jordan yeah. Peterson phenomenon of, wow, there's all of this evolved knowledge encoded in our behavior, encoded in our mythology, encoded in our um, religions that we've lost touch with, and we need to be able to integrate that. We can't completely throw it out and assume we can kind of rebuild from nothing. So yeah, there is this sense of needing to integrate all of these different levels. The problem is with integral, I think that once you start talking in terms of the colors and in terms of what it has become a kind of bit of a private language, mm. again, this was a, an interview that we did with Jamie Wheel where he talked about the best thing to do with integral is to learn it and then forget it. Yeah. Because otherwise you just start talking this this language that no one else can really understand and you get lost in the concept rather than the reality. And I think that was one of the big downsides of that whole integral emergence mm -hmm. in the 90s is people were like, I'm so integral now. You know, yeah. it almost became an identity persona in itself. Whereas the the actual integral, you're right, you incorporate it into the kind of marrow. Mm. That's why I actually started using this term alt middle, just because I think it resonated with mm. my particular audience more. They're saying, you know, everything's so politicized. What it's not a centrist view because centrist is a political stance. Mm. It's a stance about stances. It's saying, you know what, when we had modernity and then post-modernity and this sort of more liberal stance. We lost a little of the traditional value. We lost mm -hmm. the connection to spirituality. Reintegrating that as necessary part of our development is not saying, oh, well now I'm taking a conservative stance. It's saying all of this is necessary. Mm -hmm. And from the stance of someone who can't see that, it will look as if you're regressing to conservatism. Yeah, And I think, in the heterodox space, in the intellectual dark web, many of those folks, like like Rogan, mm. they, they are associated on the left as some kind of right wing lunatic. But when you mm. listen to them, you're like, actually, they're speaking integral language. Yeah, most of them. Yeah, it's sort of recognition that everything is contextual as mm. well. So you can't have a solely traditionalist response. You can't have a, a solely modernist response. You've got to integrate the best of both because. Mm. Yeah, it's contextual. Contextual. So Jay Brooks uh, sent us a dollar ninety nine, which means we have uh -huh. to answer his provocative question, which mm. is, "What is your view of intelligent design?" This is interesting. Yeah. Years ago, I would have told you that's horseshit, and well, it's interesting. Like intelligent design is, we should probably explain exactly what yeah. it is. It's the, um, I would say it's identified with Christ Christianity currently. It's, yeah, it's sort of. It's the idea that there are that there is a Christian God working out through evolution. Right. Generally speaking, I'd say it's more identified with that. And there's some very interesting books. Uh, Michael Bay, I think, wrote a book called Darwin's Black Box, looking at the sophistication of the cell, right. and saying this is far too sophisticated to have arrived through natural selection. Right. There's there's an intelligence in here. Right. Now, it's an interesting question. I'm. I am sympathetic to the idea that there is an intelligence working itself out through evolution that is not purely materialistic. Right. And I think, interestingly, even evolutionary theory is moving in that direction with epigenetics. Yes. And someone like Rupert Sheldrake, who I've also interviewed on Rebel Wisdom, talks about, he, he comes up with the idea of morphogenetic fields, that there is a sort of knowingness within, there is a patterned knowingness within nature that is not just reducible to genes and not just reducible to um, the building blocks. And his he, he's got a couple of, de of bets, one with the biologist Lewis Wolpert, mm. who says that, that, I think they bet a, a case of wine, that it would not be possible to predict the final um, structure of any creature using just the genetics alone. Mm. He thinks it's too complex. He brings mm -hmm. in ideas like protein folding is is so many, like the, there's orders of magnitude of complexity that that brings in that he doesn't think can be covered by the genes alone. Mm -hmm. I'm very sympathetic to that. I'm very sympathetic to the idea that the genes as a kind of atomistic, reductionistic kind of blueprint are insufficient to explain the complexity of life. But I don't know, I don't know whether that means that it moves into the territory of intelligent design. But I think, I think, I think that the idea that it's just random chance doesn't, it, that's question begging. Like we don't know if it's random. We don't know if it, it, it imposes a, a kind of scientific materialism on the structure of natural selection. Like we don't know if the mutations are random. 
So you, so, how do you know if the mutations are random? Like, obviously, natural selection exists because things are whittled down by the environment. But those those mutations and those kind of leaps forward, I'm not convinced that they're random. Okay, so okay, I'll tell you what I think I reject is the idea that there's intelligent design by a single creator, uh, mm. um, uh, anthropomorphized God. Mm. But I will say this. Donald Hoffman, who I've had on my show, who talks about his theory of conscious realism, uses natural selection. He's a mathematician and a, a cognitive mm. scientist at UC Irvine. He uh, uses natural selection to actually, and game theory around natural selection to show that organisms that see reality as it actually is go mm. extinct. Whereas organisms that see reality through an interface that allows them to reproduce actually continue to do well. So we mm. don't see reality as it is. So that's one twist. Then the second twist is then what is reality? Is it mm. material stuff or is it consciousness spinning up a world of interface? Mm. And that's where I think it's completely compatible with natural selection to be a consciousness-based entity. And if it's all consciousness, could there be a telos, could there be a direction mm. that this one single consciousness uh, that's dreaming it's separate is, mm. is going in, in which case, how does that manifest? Through epigenetics, through genetics? And you're right, the reductionism of genetics has since been, it's been debunked, you cannot. Yeah. Um, spin up a world from just a, a genome. It's so complicated. Now that doesn't mean that it's intelligently designed, but it doesn't mean that it's not, mm. it, or it doesn't mean that there isn't a awake intelligence at the fundamental core of everything. But also you doesn't require a designer. Like no, a Christian that's right. God outside, that's right. that's outside right. creation. It doesn't need an architect. I would say there's an imminent intelligence within, that's within nature yeah. that is playing itself out through what we call evolution what that looks like i'm i'm not a it, we can't we uh, can't know easily i, I don't yeah. know you can have plenty of peak experiences and psychedelic experiences and meditative experiences but the, you cannot apply those to what is actually reality hey Diogenes says two two whole dollars two whole dollars to or euros is it to a, to ask the question that is so easy free will is there a choice which i chooses now I, this is always a fun I'm discussion. always amazed to find. Um, I, I'm, I'm amazed that it. There are people genuinely arguing that there is no free will, because it completely. I, I I agree with Jordan Peterson where he says it. It it f so fundamentally challenges our conception of ourselves that it can't be true. I think that there's that truth, but I also believe that there are levels of awareness and levels of free will. Like we realize that some of our behavior is is reactive. I think free will is more, or consciousness is much more of a kind of error correction pattern than it is a gen, a driver. So I think a lot of things that we think of as being our own free choice are probably instinctive, but I think we have the ability to reflect on them and to kind of upgrade our, uh, our kind of operating system. Yeah. And that's more what free will is, I think, rather than that we have absolute absolute freedom to choose in the moment. Yeah, so my my conception of this has evolved over the years as well. I, I consider it now it's more like free won't. Like mm. we have a, a kind of a conscious level override of things. But, mm. but even more than that, there's an interesting conception that Hoffman again talks about. So his theory is that if everything is consciousness, then you can describe the dynamics of the world through the interaction of conscious agents, mm. starting at the simplest level of one bit conscious agents that perceive, decide and act and they sum up mathematically to larger conscious agents. So we're the instantiation of multiple subconscious agents mm. that form minds and minds and minds all the way down, like a fractal type pattern. And if that's true, each individual conscious agent may have the capacity for a free choice mm. decision. But since it's an instantiation of a larger system, it's constrained by the agents underneath it and the agents above it. So mm. at any given level, there's a bit of free will or free won't, but it's not as free as you think because what's above and what's below constrain the, the options. Mm. So in a way we have free will all the way up and down and we don't. Mm. And if that's true, this gets to this hive mind egregore concept that BJ Campbell promoted on your show. If we as individual subminds instantiate a higher consciousness beyond our ability to detect, that consciousness has its own free will decisions that feed down and constrain ours. So mm. that's why you may get caught in a filter bubble 
thinking everything is a conspiracy about vaccines. And you don't even know why, but you get so outraged when someone disagrees. Mm. And could that be the downward pressure of a larger instantiated submind that's that's potentiated by likes, dislikes, our neurotransmitter of this? And mm. I think it's worth thinking about. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> We've gotten real deep for a middle of the day live show yeah. right before you have to get on a plane. Um, I hope you got your two, two euros worth. I hope so. Man, it's a great question. Um, where are we at? Emma Dickinson's talking to Ashley. Daijin says, Angela DeLulo says, we don't have free will. It's his direct experience. Do the awakened ones lose their free will? So Angela, my my friend, who's mm. quite quite highly realized, but also like a normal, reasonable yeah. guy. The way he talks about free will is very nuanced. Actually, it's not as simple as that. Mm. He's done a video on this and he's talked to me personally about it. He says, the question you ask when mm. you're looking from the standpoint of awakening is who is it that's making those decisions. So what mm. self is yeah. making the decisions? But what he experiences is, mm. is empty open potential happening. So the entire universe coming together in real time in the present moment. So mm. there's something happening. D he says it this way, decisions are made. Mm. It's unclear what is making what's them. making them. Mm. What's the self that's making there's them? There's a very interesting paradox as well of the more, certainly that's true for me, of the more kind of personal growth work that I've done, the more I've kind of tried to listen into what uh, Peter Lindbergh would call the daemon, mm. uh, the creative force, where some things just feel energetically right and some things feel energetically wrong. And you get, like, I would say that developing a more sophisticated sense of what that is and where something just feels like, oh, that's out of alignment. I don't quite know why, but there's a reason for it. And then sometimes it will unfold. It's like, yeah, I wasn't feeling completely bought into that. And I realize now that it was because of I was feeling something off about the person that I was going to be working with or about the creative energy of this project that wasn't quite right or whatever it is. But the more that I felt that I've kind of tuned into that, in a way, there's a paradox of less free will in a way because that demonic inspiration has got its own intelligence and its own energy that that constrains in a way, like that ethical sense as you develop it in a way constrains your behavior because you can't do certain things. Yeah, you, There are certain behaviors or certain friends or certain kind of things that you used to do, people you used to hang out with that you can't hang out with anymore or you can't do certain things that you used to do, like numbing yourself in various different ways. So in a way it sort of constrains your, there is a dialogue with that kind of inner ethical sense or conscience or daemon or whatever you want to call it that in a way does seem to constrict um, behavior in a way that is, yeah, that, that there's sort of this dialogue like before, but that, that the interesting thing is like before that, before developing that, that sense, maybe I didn't have free will because I was unconsciously like going through the actions, going yeah. through the actions or, or like when I'm drinking to numb myself out or I'm shopping to numb myself out or any of these like addictive behaviors, by definition, if you're doing those addictive behaviors, you don't necessarily have full free will over yeah, that yeah. because you're acting unconsciously and you are you are kind of in a, in a feedback loop of unconsciousness with those behaviors. Yes. So when you tap into that kind of inner sense of, you know, I shouldn't do that, I should act more like this. And then you, as you start to attune more to that demonic inspiration, ethical sense, whatever, that's also limiting your free will. So you've gone from one, <laughs> you've gone from one position where you had less free will to another position where you have less free will, but there's a conscious choice in, in how much you start to listen to that conscience. And so that's certainly my felt sense mm. is that there is a personal choice in whether to listen to that or not. But the more that you identify with it, the more it constrains your behavior, but, but in a way that feels very freeing. Right. That there's something about listening to that and acting from a more ethical, ethically aligned sense that feels more expansive. Yeah. It feels like a more expansive reality it feels like a more expansive conscious place to be so there's a weird kind of dialogue between the two there and again i think listening even to you talk the question would ultimately come whose free will is constrained who is the self that's having this free will choice and and, and some might say well that egoic sense of self is actually illusory to the extent so listening to whatever that demon is that <laughs> that that itself is awareness itself just happening, like, it, mm. it, the, it, and you're now not resisting, or you're not apparently resisting from the standpoint of ego. Ego is mm. becoming more transparent to what 
what's actually happening and allowing it rather than resisting it. One of the journeys apparently of Enneagram six mm. is Enneagram six has a deep fear of not trust. It doesn't trust itself. Mm. So as an ego mind, I don't believe I have the capacity to do the right thing in the world. So I rely on relationships with others. I rely on hard work, diligence, preparation, these kind of things, because I deeply don't trust my intuition. Mm. So part of the journey of the six is go inward and realize there's a deeper intuition that's always safe, eternal, and cannot really go wrong. And when mm. you learn to listen to that by quieting the mind, then the relationships get stronger. Everything else just happens to click into place. So it's interesting. And mm. where does free will fit into that? You're kind of giving up the egoic free will to the deeper what's just happening. Mm. Yeah, and you and that is that an act of free will? And again, yeah. from what standpoint? Yeah, and the conversation around free will has been influenced by Harris the, and well, and also the realization from neuroscience that many of the things that we consider to be our free choice, we've already decided the That's impulses right. have come from the brain well before we've made a conscious rationalization, which also connects to Jonathan Haidt's work exactly. of the rider and the elephant. Exactly. The rider's job, the elephant is kind of our instinctive behavior that we act from. And then the rider's job mostly is to provide a kind of post facto hoc, jo yeah. <laughs> justification for what we've already decided to do. Yeah. And there is ev there's evidence for that. But I wonder whether there is still a window for free will in the in the potential reviewing and upgrading of that machinery of that elephant kind of yeah machinery that that's my experience that's my felt sense felt sense of 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 doing that kind of personal growth work particularly in sort of group work where i've gone through processes where i do feel like i'm tapping into new behavior or identifying some pattern for the first time. And that feels like giving myself new options, becoming aware of an unconscious pattern that I've been playing out in the past and then tying it to something like, oh my God, that's where it comes from. That's the, mm. that's the conditioning, that's the experience of my mm. parents or whatever that has led to that playing out. Suddenly I have an option not to do that behavior. Yeah, That's my felt sense of it. So I'm, I'm very skeptical of the, the, Hard determinist, yeah. Yeah, of saying, well, actually science proves that that's not what's happening. It's right. like, no, no, I, I think there are, like the phenomenology of our experience is something that's very hard to scientifically quantify, but it's obviously real. Yeah, it, it's the most real thing we have. So so, so back to that, because that's mm. crucial. This elephant rider thing that I, I, I talk about that a lot, that the elephant, mm. the rider is the elephant's press secretary. Mm. It evolved to kind of convince others in a tribal situation that our unconscious elephant is already right. And it doesn't know us, it's opaque to the knower of this. But but back to the elephant. So you're making the con unconscious conscious. Now in Hoffman's estimation, that elephant mm. is a sub mind made of subconscious agents that are awake themselves, that are having conscious experience, that are making free will decisions unapparent to the higher mind, mm. but that constrain the higher mind. and all the way down, that thing's made up of stuff. So it might be that free will is actually the root. Elephants all the way down. Elephants all the way down. Not it, turtles. It, not turtles. They got it wrong. It's an elephant. And that elephant is thinking, is is, is, is making free will decisions that are coming from its own awareness. And I don't know, I don't know. Mm. But the felt sense, like you say. It's mostly donut related, I think with elephants. A hundred percent. And me. Yeah. I'm basically like Homer Simpson, donut. Um, let's see where we're at. And let me know when you have to run, by the way, because I know you have mm. a flight. Lisa Goodman says, the answers may be in the new radio burst patterns found in some galaxy three million light years away. Fox Mulder told me. <laughs> uh, but the true story in the news this week, very curious about what the cause is. Oh, they're always seeing finding radio bursts and stuff. And uh, mm. you, you know, what's interesting is, that, well, 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 we'll save that for another time. But um, the, the James Webb, um, oh, wait, here we go, Brian J. How do materialists, i.e. Sam Harris, reconcile consciousness while also being against free will. How do you step outside of reality to observe consciousness when there is only matter? Okay, so this is interesting to me because this idea of the materialist construct of consciousness is fascinating. Mm. How can material spin up an internal subjective state, the taste mm. of chocolate or whatever, and or donuts. Or donuts for that, or elephants, dung. Well, the interesting, just to interject, um, Ian McGilchrist. Yes, who, one of my favorite interviews you did. Who um, has recently come out with uh, a book. Um, the Pro Trouble with Things. Yeah, the, yeah. Mat the Matter with Things. The Matter with Things. He says, let's stop thinking that minds are the things that we don't understand. He said, we don't even know what matter is. That's right. 
Um, and he starts from that perspective of, well, actually, we, we don't know what matter is. Yes, and that's the Hoffman perspective. Yeah. We, you can't find matter. You don't mm. know what it is. So why are you assuming it's real? Why are you reifying it? Yeah. He, he actually calls it a rookie mistake. Mm. He says, um, we made the rookie mistake of confusing our interface with reality. When we have a desktop on a computer, we go, yeah, there's a trash can, there's a document. We don't literally think they're trash cans and documents. We know that they're symbolic of an experience or an, a, a process that you're gonna do. Reality may be the same way, mm. that we're seeing process. McGilchrist really in that matter with things is pointing at life is not stuff and matter and this and that. It's a process, it's an ongoing process. It's relational, it's contextual. It's um, it's very different than what the left brain might say that it is, which is stuff, mm. uh, parts that spin up a hole. No, it's really, it's a hole first mm. that then we can drill in and imagine parts, but reality is just this. Mm. So one of the one of the only real insights that I've had that made me go, oh yeah, that's the nature of reality was the insight that at any given moment, there's only the present moment and there's only this. Mm. So in other words, your image in my eyes right now, my, in my perception, is all there is. It's mm. just that in and of itself. There's no, it's not about matter, it's not about consciousness, it's just light and sound and this and that. And that can mm. palpably be experienced. Um, We've got time for one more question? Yeah, what do we got? The elephants are the top, are on top of the turtles, says Purple Sweet. <laughs> yeah. What about uh, Bernardo Castrop enters the chat? Mm. Yeah, uh. yeah, there it is. Um, yeah. Let's see, Brian J. Where? Let's scroll back and see if we can find something here. Yeah, Bernardo Castro. We might be toying with the idea of getting him for our final uh, event. Oh, that'd be great. I interviewed him. He was fantastic. Mm. Yeah, Bernardo. If you talk to him offline too, like mm. he's had the experiences, the psychedelic experiences. He's had done the personal growth. He he. But he's a very computer oriented minded guy, and yep. um, so he brings that sensibility. What does that mean that we've you just got some more, ma more money? Oh, let's scroll down and see, because I'm all about that cash money. There it is. Jay Brooks gave oh. us $20 US. How many pounds is that? That's at least 16, 16 of your British pounds. 16 British pounds. Jay Brooks yeah. says, could ancient Egyptian and Chinese art depict DNA? Hmm. JP. Egyptian and Chinese art. Boy, I don't know about the answer. I don't know about that one. Um, do you have to give the money back if you can't answer the question? <laughs> Um, there is an you interesting, have to make up an so there was a, there was a big, um, I don't know if you saw the recent conversation between Jordan Peterson and Richard Dawkins, mm. where there was a lot of, con well, there was a lot of kind of, um, I would guess kind of, uh, l criticism of Peterson online. Cause he went down the rabbit hole of arguing that DNA was connected to the double helix the, the double helix structure of DNA was connected to the the, the snakes intertwining mm -hmm. and imagery. How do you see us? Right. How do you see us? Staff of the medical professional, mm. the medical profession, and that on psychedelics, uh, indigenous cultures could see DNA. Now, this wasn't created by Jordan Peterson. There's a book uh, to that effect called "The Cosmic Serpent" by Jeremy Narby, where he makes that argument. He spent a lot of. He's an anthropologist. He spent a lot of time with. Um, tribes in the Amazon who were um, doing a lot of ayahuasca. And he said that those tribes, he asked the tribes how they knew that certain plants were kind of med medic medicinally useful. Mm. And they said, because the plants tell us. Mm. He's like, this doesn't make any sense. But he had the experience of doing ayahuasca with them and he came out a believer that actually they were communicating with the plants in some way. Mm -hmm. And they told him that the 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 coiled serpent was something that they could see, they could mm. see and they could interact with. And he came to believe that they could, they were seeing the structure of DNA and DNA in some way was related to that, um, yeah, to this kind of eternal pattern of mm. being mm. that was manifesting in all of these different ways. And I don't know if that links to, I don't know about the link to China and to Egypt. Jay Brooks would have to kind of maybe, maybe tell us, but, but it's fascinating. I, I came out of reading, of reading that book by Jeremy Narby and thought, you know, he, he makes a good case. He makes a really interesting I, case. And it's one that's been very influential on the psychedelic counterculture. I can imagine. I, I'm gonna reframe that from Hoffman's conscious agent theory. So mm. DNA is not a thing. It's not a pre-existing entity. It is our interface's perception of that 
Mm. And what that may be is yeah. the, the agent of organizational structure for mm. you know, a life's um, unfolding in protein encoding, but we see it as this helix. Now, when you do ayahuasca or any psychedelic, mm. one explanation is, is a technological hack mm. to change your interface from a human interface to a different interface. Mm. And if that, if that hack came from an Amazonian plant, Mm. Now you are shifting perception to a plant-like conscious interface where, oh, the plant told me. Well, yeah, because you can see from the perspective of plant consciousness what mm. the world would look like. Yeah. Anybody who's done acid, you, you can feel that, oh, this is a fungal type of consciousness and, mm. and psilocybin feels like a mushroom type of consciousness, mm. you know, whatever that is. Yeah, and ayahuasca yeah. does have that kind of sensual feeling of, the vine, even though the psychoactive DMT part of the of the brew is actually from the leaves rather than the vine, right? But there is something about it that feels sensual, feels feminine, feminine. feels kind of like that. That's the nature of the kind of consciousness that you feel that you're interacting with. And it's it's night and day with mm. another hallucinogen or another DMT component or whatever, and yeah. and that tells you there's something up. So yeah, that DNA thing is actually more interesting a question than. You know, years ago I'd have been like, that was just woo woo nonsense. Now I'm like, well, but wait, mm. you know, even from a science mindset, there's maybe explanations if we start with mm. questioning the fundamental paradigm of what 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 matter is. Yeah. Um, how much time you got, dude? Are you? I, uh, it's got his $20 <laughs> worth. That's good. <laughs> good, all right. We, we, think, did, we um, did that. Um, sorted him out. I love it, Jay. Uh, let's yeah, see. Yeah, I probably need to head pretty soon just okay. to finish my packing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so let's see if Brian J, will answer Brian J's real quick. Um, shapes are fundamentally patterns of reality. Then he says, certain structures and shapes are fundamentally to, to reality themselves. The shape creates potential and is and it's low fractal manifestations. And, and again, I, I would say, I don't know that the shape has causative power. Mm. So what Hoffman would say about- Well, there's also a sense that if you wanna take it down to what is the structure of DNA really, or are we in some ways imposing that structure because we know with the subatomic physics depending on how you measure yeah you measure the the, the two, double slit experiment you can a particle is either a, a wave or a particle which is bizarre like mm. how can it be that indeterminate at that level so one wonders like there are almost certainly like these patterns of being that that manifest at different levels of being as well in a sort of fractal reality kind of way mm -hmm. but is there something that the yeah Maybe there's a kind of indeterminate state that something like DNA inhabits. I think that uh, gets to the core of like, well, what what is the fundamental nature of reality? Mm. When my friend Angelo has talked about what reality is really like at the deepest stage, mm. and he does this in his book in a very cautious way because it can actually destabilize. The first time I read the chapter, I I, I wanted to throw the book in the toilet because it was like, there's something that felt quite true about it, mm. but it was so disconnected from our human experience, the, that what fundamental reality is, that it mm. was almost like the ego recoils. But mm. it was that it, there is this indeterminate potential and being and non-being are not even two and up comes reality. And then we throw these perceptual filters have evolved over time to make meaning out of it. So there may not mm. even be a real reality at the core of everything. What do you see in there, dog? Uh, Dawkins is like the black knight in Monty Python, the Holy Grail. Complete denial of anything that goes beyond the Physicalist, Physicalist paradigm. paradigm, absolutely. <laughs> we were talking about Dawkins. Just but a flesh wound. <laughs> <laughs> what are you gonna do, bleed on me? <laughs> Always look on the physical side of life. <laughs> life is really a piece of shit. Life's a piece of shit when, when you, you take it. it. <laughs> Life's a laugh and death's a joke, it's true. You'll see it's all a show, keep them laughing as you go, but just remember that the last laugh is on you. <laughs> And always look on the bright side of life. <laughs> always look on the bright side of life. Because <laughs> death is just a show. Keep them laughing as you go. But just remember that the last laugh is on you. You know what? I think, I think... We've had the last laugh. I think that's the, the right place to end. David Fuller, I yeah. have to say like, we've done probably eight hours of conversations just on camera, yeah. some of which we'll use, some of which were just like warm up. Mm. Uh, 
and it's been a joy, dude. I can't believe you're leaving. I'm feeling fuller, uh, less fuller and emptier Aww. for you not being here. Yeah, I miss you, dude. Bro, bro, bro. Guys <laughs> and gals, thank you for joining us. Karaoke with David Risa. I know, right? We just I did hope it. everyone was singing along. I of course so. they were. Yeah. They're all money five. They're all nerds <laughs> like us. Um, we will connect again. We're mm -hmm. going to do more things. You're on travels. You're doing great things. I can't wait to see what you do next. Um, we're all in this mission of growth, like this telos of pulling us in this direction. The daemon yeah. is drawing us together. So I'm excited mm -hmm. to see where it all goes, brother. Trust the daemon. Trust it. Just don't trust Matt Damon. That guy is a no. creep. <laughs> uh, all right, guys. I'm going to end this by fading us to black. And we are so out. Bye. Oh no, are we still talking, buddy? Because no. we don't want to get canceled by doing racist accents. <laughs> <laughs> that was him, not me. <laughs> that was the white guy trying to do the Indian. If anyone's wondering, I'm going to end it now. End stream.